Now that this vintage HP LaserJet 2 is producing beautiful prints, we're going to address the last few issues, including a really noisy lower fan, some squeaks, and just general preventive maintenance and lubrication. In our first video, we got this vintage HP LaserJet 2 laser printer from 1987 to output a test page. Next, we address the poor print quality caused by the 20-year-old toner cartridge. Now we're going to address its noises and do some preventive maintenance to keep it running beautifully for years to come. I wasn't sure if I was going to do a third video on this old printer, but after finishing the last one, it printed so well but sounded so sad, I just had to. So we'll remove the toner and flip it over carefully, because it's a heavy beast. Usually there are a lot of screws to remove from the bottom cover, but this printer is missing all but four of them. It looks like this machine has all the dust in it. It looks like there is a RAM expansion installed. I should have caught that on the self-test page. That explains why the self-test seemed to take so long to run. The caps all look good too, probably because they're high quality Nichicon brand. Okay, let's get rid of the majority of the dust. This probably wasn't the best plan in the kitchen, but what are you gonna do? The fan is stiff and hard to turn. I'm surprised it still runs at all. These end bushings always get dirty and are pretty easy to clean. I'll just pull it off and clean it with isopropyl alcohol and a Q-tip with most of the cotton removed. Then I just add the teeniest drop of lube and it should be good to go. Of all the printers I've worked on over the years, I think the HP LaserJet 2 is one of the most reliable and simplest to work on. It's just a well-designed machine that has a good separation of components. A lot of modern machines put everything into one or two circuit boards and combine systems to the point that if one small thing fails, you have to replace a major assembly. This will probably be the last video for a while on this particular printer, but in the future I do plan to restore some old PCs and print to it. I also plan to do a video on the history of early HP LaserJet, so look for that in the future. I showed how to remove the top cover and bracket in the first video, so we'll just zip through that part. Speaking of parts, I did get a blog post up with the part numbers for many commonly replaced parts for these machines. I'll put a link in the description below. Now we remove the DC power supply, AC power supply, fuser, and main drive motor, as we did in the first video. In the first video, I incorrectly called the switches on the Paper Control PCA safety switches. These are actually the electrophotoconductor switches that detect the presence of a toner cartridge and set the sensitivity of the drum. The actual safety switch is here in the top of the DC power supply. When working with an unfamiliar machine, I like to organize the screws in the order they were removed. Organizing like this makes reassembly a lot easier and you make sure you don't have leftover parts because, you know, we all have a collection, right? The upper main body assembly is just attached by four screws. Once they're removed, it just lifts off. Under a safety cover is the mirror that reflects the toner down onto the drum in the toner cartridge. You have to be very careful cleaning this mirror as its coating is on the top surface. I always use a cotton pad and alcohol and just a lot of TLC. You can also see the small red blank lamps here. These lamps erase the latent image of the drum so that it's ready for charging for the next cycle. I need to get good access to the delivery assembly where the paper exits the printer. The fuser insulating cover has two screws and a couple clips. The delivery coupler is a fairly high failure part. You can see how the gears have grayed. They get a lot of heat from the fuser that causes them to break down. This one isn't great, but since I don't have a spare, it'll have to do for now. Next, we need to remove four screws at the ends of the delivery assembly. Four more screws and the delivery assembly, along with the lower delivery cover, come right out. The delivery assembly needs to have the hard rubber rollers cleaned. If the printer is jamming here, then these are usually the cause. This is also typically the cause of a lot of squeaks. Generally, you want to put a teeny bit of lube, like TriFlow, on brass bushings, but leave plastic bushings alone. They do not need lubricated. I will also lube the ends on each exit roller as these are a very common source for noises. The fuser is what melts the toner and presses it into the paper. This unit looks okay, but it's making a lot of noise. First, I'll clean the picker fingers that separate the paper from the Teflon roller. 
they tend to get a buildup of toner that can cause jam, so I'll just gently remove any. I'm going to take a look at the ground contact on the fuser roller since this tends to be the source of a lot of squeaks. Sure enough, these contacts are really nasty, so I'm going to replace them. Be sure you never use any kind of lubricant in the fuser. The fuser is very hot and lubricants tend to migrate, especially when heated, and it will smell like you wouldn't believe. I also need to make sure there's no oil or contamination on the halogen lamp. If I touched it or got grease on it, then it will eventually burn out from the resultant hot spot. Just to be sure, I'll clean it with a swab and some alcohol. While I reassemble the fuser, I want to mention that it is the source of the most common error code on this machine, Error 50. If the fuser fails to come to temperature within the time limit, it throws this code. Check the lamp, the thermistor, and the thermal fuse for continuity and clean the thermistor if it has a lot of buildup. I added a blog post with the most common error codes for these machines and will include a link to it in the description for the video. While you're down there, don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to see more cool retro tech. The delivery assembly and cover can be a pain to reinstall, but you can do it with a little jiggling. The official way to do it is to remove the blank lamps, but that's not really needed. When lubricating gears, I prefer to use Teflon impregnated triflow, but a white lithium grease will work just fine. Always use a minimal amount of lubrication when you're working around the fuser. You do not want that grease to migrate into the fuser. Now I'll just reinstall the delivery coupler and fuser insulating cover in the same way they were removed. Make sure to use the correct screws for the insulating cover. Next, I'm going to clean and lube the main drive gears. I clean the gears with an old toothbrush and alcohol. Once they're dry, I'll apply a light coating of grease on the outer gears. The inner gears that are driven by the main motor itself do not get lubed. Make sure you use an appropriate grease, such as lithium or triflow. Never use WD-40 for anything in a printer. It contains an agent that turns into a stiff goo over time and just jams things up. Finally, we just reassemble everything in the opposite order that we took them apart. I'm really happy with the way this printer turned out. The print quality is great, and this should get it sounding better. It should be in great shape for a few years to come. I look forward to getting an old computer up and running to print to it with. The shop is coming along nicely, and once it's finished, I'll get a new video out every week. In the meantime, please let me know in the comments what you'd like to see next. There's a link in the description for this video that shows a few of the items I have on hand. Wow, this thing sounds a thousand times better, and the prints still look awesome. Check out the blog post for more information on this printer, and let me know in the comments what you'd like to see next. Click the Ravenwolf logo to subscribe, and here's another video you might like.